the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. Why did he use that word? God goes to extreme measures to bring the lost to himself. The greatest gift you will ever give this world is your intimacy with God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all three inside of me. I've got the power right now. I think what Jesus really wants is people to go. I want to be the answer to Jesus' prayer request. Welcome to the Fuel for the Harvest podcast. When this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, then shall the end come. Hey everyone, and welcome to this latest episode of Fuel for the Harvest. This is Charlie. And this is Nathan, and we will be your host for today. And we have joining us once again, the one, the only, the Forge speaker, Santi Fuentes. Welcome to the podcast, Santi. It's great to be back with you guys here. We're so glad to have you. And uh, today you're coming from Mexico City. Is that right? That is correct. That is correct. Thank you for joining us across several thousand miles. I don't know how far it is from Denver to Mexico City, but I imagine probably like at least a thousand miles. And know. which is which is awkward is we're the same altitude as you guys. So the distance between these two places is huge, but the altitude is the same. Huh. So, how interesting. That's a fun fact. Uh, mile high. <laughs> mile high. Well, uh, for those of you joining us, uh, this is a continuation of our conversation on deconstruction. And as you know, we've been working slowly but surely through various questions or triggers that lead people to deconstruct. And we've been uh, providing what we are attempting to call an answer to those questions. Um, and we've covered quite a few subjects up to this point. So if you haven't gotten a chance to listen to previous podcast episodes, go ahead and go do that. We would love uh, for you to take a listen. But uh, this week, we are addressing kind of a, a, a one question that's two questions, uh, to put it simply. So the often people will say that the God, the reason that they deconstructed is because they looked at the God of the Old Testament and they looked at the God of the New Testament and they said, these two don't match. And the second part of this question is the reason that they don't match is it's because it seems like the God of the Old Testament specifically is this really intense, judgy God um, who executes judgment and harsh, harsh, harsh judgment on people. And then, of course, the God of the New Testament represented in Jesus is this God of love and mercy and peace and all this stuff. So uh, ultimately, today we're going to be looking at this question, is the God of the Old Testament really different slash is he okay is he justified in doing what he did or called israel to do in the old testament so which specifically would be his commands to go kill entire villages of of people right yes so without any further ado what do you guys think what is the answer to this question revelation 1 8 says i am the alpha and the omega says the lord god who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. To think that there is a God of the Old Testament that can be deemed as judgy or harsh, and then he turns into this more tender, more loving God, it's walking on thin ice, to be honest with you. You're getting close to blasphemy because he says, I am the same. And his uh, son, Jesus, is the same yesterday and, and, and today and forever so there is no shadow of changing in his character now he changes uh decisions as he did in the book of jonah when he had decided to just get rid of the ninevites and then he changed uh, his judgment on them but his character did not change what changed was was his uh, judgment or his plans for certain people. Just as when a sinner today um, repents, then there is a difference in the relationship with God and, of course, the destiny of after this life. So uh, he never changes. He's, he's the same. And understanding that he used to be this way, but now is this other way, puts us so close to uh unbiblical and blasphemous mm -hmm. to be just just to state it just like it is so we shouldn't get right go out of those gate. places what i said right out of the gate uh here we That's go right. so 
as I compare the two, I could see on a surface level glance um, coming to a conclusion uh, that God in the Old Testament is different from God or Jesus in the New Testament at surface level glance. But I would say it's an unfair conclusion if you deep dive into either one. I I look at I'm going exactly the same. Um, and how would I see that? Well, um, we could look at the mercy of God in the Old Testament and the wrath and judgment of God in the New Testament, which I think sometimes those factors are overlooked with this question. So if we look at Jesus. Um, he talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. So if you want to talk about uh, judgment or wrath um, in the person of Jesus, man, that's that's pretty intense right there. Um, secondly, we see in Jesus him saying and Revelation saying, hey, he's coming back to judge all of mankind. All Every human will be judged by Jesus. And he's coming back with a double-edged sword out of his mouth, a robe dipped in blood, defeating his enemies. We see this nature in Jesus himself. He's the one who went around, like he went to the temple one day full of anger at, at injustice and flipped temples in the table or flipped the tables in the temple and drove people out with a whip because of his righteous anger. Um, we also see Jesus really coming against religious leaders and systems as well. Uh, he called Herod a fox, like, which is a really derogatory name. Um, so you see all these types of things in Jesus in the midst of his absolute love and mercy and kindness. But there is an intensity to Jesus that's often missed or overlooked, I would say. And then if we look at the Old Testament, the nature of God, um, there's so much mercy and grace that I think is often overlooked in the midst of his judgment um, or his wrath. And I would love, Santi, for you to share a little bit on that as well. Um but I know for a fact that God waited for years and generations and generations at times in the Old Testament before he poured out his judgment, um, before he even judged the Canaanites. I actually had it written in a note somewhere here as I was looking at some things about this topic. Um, uh, he waited. Here it is. He waited 400 years to actually judge the Canaanites in their wickedness until it reached the point of like, this is no longer tolerable. There's no point of return for this people. They've become so wicked, so evil. I'm going to put an end to this. There needs to be consequences for what they're doing. And so God waited in mercy, in grace, 400 years. Now here's one verse, I'll say this, and then I wanna hear what you guys think. Um, uh, Ezekiel 33, 11, God says about himself, um, as surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so that they can live. Turn, turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die? So God's heart was that people would be restored to him, repented and living rightly um, for their sake, for his sake, for the whole world, really. And um, I think that makes a huge difference. So, Santi, I want to hear what you have to say about that, Nate, you too. And then, Santi, I've heard you say in the past, I'll ask this question, maybe you throw it in. Um, I've heard something really uh, insightful from you on Methuselah and hmm. God's work over generations and what that looked like and how long he waited. But anyway, what do you guys think about that? Let me, let me link back to what you were saying about Jesus. I think uh, when you try to deconstruct God's character and say, oh, Jesus is different. Well, a very pertinent uh, question to the person that does that is found in John 14, 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like it's like if we could sit around coffee table, a person that is doubting that Jesus is, is the same as the Father and, and says, no, 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 but that was a awful God to have. He was harsh and, and just uh, mean. Uh, well, let's bring Jesus into the conversation. And, and Jesus could easily start the conversation with, with, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Mm. Like, we are the same person. So it's we, true. We share the same attributes. And guess who sends people to hell? So I know that's a really abrupt way of saying that. But take a look at Matthew 25, around verse 31. 
uh, basically the Son of Man is going to come in his glory and the angels with him and he's going to sit on his glorious throne and all the nations are going to be gathered before him and he will separate one people from another uh, as a shepherd as a shepherd separates sheep from goats and he's going to put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left and to the, those on his right he's going to say come into my kingdom um, and then he's going to say to those on his left going down to verse 41 depart from me you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So to say that the God of the New Testament is not judgy is a bit wrong. Uh, judge, he judges rightly. He is a good judge. He's a righteous judge, but uh, he absolutely is a judge. Um, and he's the one who's going to cast people off into eternal torment um, in, in uh, according to Matthew 25. Uh, one fun fact to notice there, uh, noted, uh, some people will say that the Son of Man does not equal Son of God. Um, people will say the reason Jesus called himself the Son of Man is because he was trying to highlight his humanity. Take note of how he uses the name Son of Man in verse 31 and highlights his divinity as the one who sits on the throne. Um, just a fun fact, totally off topic, but I wanted to draw your attention to it. Hey, no, that's a good point. And I would, I would even highlight something there. Um, while he is the one that does that, and while he is the one who execute, executed judgment in the Old Testament as well, um, it isn't his ultimate desire or heart. So I read that verse out of Ezekiel where he says, I don't, I don't delight in the death of, of wicked people. It's almost identical in the New Testament where it says the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand, he's actually patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And so I think it's even interesting that, hey, Hell was created for the devil and his angels, but those who reject the gospel of Christ, they end up there because they're rejecting what God has for them. Something important to say here is uh, John 5, 22 says, uh, says this, for the father judges no one. So the father judges no one. And then he continues saying, so also the son gives life to whom he will for the father judges no one but has given all judgment to the son that all may honor the son just as they honor the father so there is there is this um uncomprehensible character of god where we tend to relate to just one side of god and leave the rest for later and when we look at his at the way he he performs everything he do the bible says that that he is righteous and 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 we tend to confuse these two terms righteous is the virtue and justice is the enacting of that virtue of righteousness so everything god does is just but he's also loving and he's also merciful and he's also uh holy and holy anger i mean it's all of him into everything he does mm -hmm. that's why you were uh saying charlie and 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 incorrectly saying with abraham he told him oh and by the way your descendants will be enslaved until the iniquity of the amorites and the and the canaanites uh, reaches its its uh it's a uh, highest level and then i'll use my nation to bring judgment upon them so it was a way of giving them chance also to some of them to believe because abraham was a canaanite wasn't he i mean he could have saved some of those i'm not saying he did he did not i'm not saying that i'm just saying he gave them time just as in the days of noah um, he had a servant called enoch and Enoch had a son, according to Genesis 5, 23, 24, he had a son and named him Methuselah. There's a lot of uh, debate about the, the, the meaning of the name, but uh, the late um, theologian pastor, James Montgomery Boyce, he used to say the best way to understand the meaning of Methuselah is when he dies, he will come makes no sense until you read the little uh note it was more like a note than a letter i believe uh, of jude uh, second uh, to last book of the bible and he says enoch spoke about the lord coming with these thousands of saints 
and and so what Enoch believed is that when Methuselah would die, there was going to be judgment, and he thought the Lord is coming. So from Genesis, you go to Revelation 19, but that was not the judgment that God had in mind at the time, but the flood. When in the year when Methuselah died, the flood came. Now, Methuselah is the man that has lived the most. And so he lived 969 years. Talk about patience with sinners. There was this big billboard with the name Methuselah saying, repent, the Lord will come back. Therefore, we find uh, to talk about God's mercy in the Bible, we find also a very uh, old saying or way to say it, which is long suffering, right? He's he's just there waiting and man is spitting on his face and he's giving him a chance to repent. That's that's what I see uh, when I think about the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament is the same, exactly the same God. Mm. We should not uh, temper with that saying, oh, it was different because then we're going to end up uh, mixing a lot of things. We were talking about uh, God's judgment being the same. Well, guess what? The book of Revelation speaks that the same plagues that came upon Egypt in, in, in the book of Exodus will come upon the whole world. All of them except the dying of the firstborns. All, but, but all of them will be there. So think about it. The Egyptians went through their own uh, tribulation, which is just mind-blowing. The kind of judgment that God brought with them. And later the Bible says, I played with them like a toy. They offended me. And, and I had to treat them that way. And then you see that do, uh, happening to the whole world. So talk about being the same. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. Couldn't have said it better ourselves, I guess. Um, so I I would say that at the core of all of this, um, one thing that I want to... So I think we've decisively said that the God of the New Testament and the God of the Old Testament are the same guy. Uh, they have the same characters, the same nature, the same desires. Um, the, I love that verse that you highlighted, Charlie, out of Ezekiel. I, I've never read that one before, so... Well, I've read it, but I've never registered it before. And uh, so that was really, really good and cool how that connects uh, God's heartbeat all the way from Genesis to Revelation. So I think we can decisively say anybody who's arguing that the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament are different, they're arguing from a, a, a position of no evidence because all of the biblical evidence supports that they're the same guy. So let's move on to that second part yeah. of that question. That perhaps this, perhaps this second question is the one that we could maybe say is the the toughest one that gets to well okay i see what you guys are saying they're not different but right how about god commanding them to kill lots of different people in the old testament well what about god even saying hey don't leave anyone the fathers the mothers the kids all of them they gotta go right and so you're gonna you're gonna find these stories in the book of joshua uh, most frequently. The, you'll find them kind of scattered other places, but we're going to focus in on the book of Joshua in what is called by academics the Canaanite conquest, also known as Israel taking over the land from Canaan and other people groups. So Santi highlighted uh, just a few minutes ago that when God uh, was making his covenant, his promise with Abraham, he said, hey, your people are going to be slaves in Egypt for 400 years, because the sins of the Amorites have not yet become full. Now, the Amorites and the Canaanites, they're all in the same place. Are they the same people group? I don't know. Is it just two names for the same people group, or are they two different people groups? Do you know the answer, Santi? Different people groups. Different people groups. All right. So they're different people groups, and they are, but they're in the same location. And God is saying, I'm waiting until they fully deserve the judgment that I'm bringing on them, and then I will execute my judgment using your people during the days of the Canaanite conquest. So what do we say about God, the God of the Bible, who says it's good or it's justified, let's say it's justified for you to go and execute judgment on 
on the Amorites and the Canaanites and the other people groups living in that land? What do we say about that, God? So I think we have to ask this question with that to answer that first. Um, is it fair for God to take Israel to be the enactors of his judgment on other nations in the world? And I would say, well, one, God is God and he can do whatever he wants. So, yes. But secondly, God also used other nations to judge Israel when they were wrong and correct Israel when they were wrong. So God's judgment was fair. Like we read all throughout the Old Testament, other nations and God saying, hey, I'm allowing them to overtake you because you've disobeyed me, because you've not glorified. You're going a wrong path of destruction. I need to correct you. You need to be judged and brought back into right living. Um, yeah, I don't. So that's one factor where we can say God's judgment is fair. So, what about this this specific question then? Um, is it right? Is it moral? How can God ask them to go kill all these people? Right, and I'll just highlight what on what you said there, Charlie. So, basically, you're asking a moral question. So, there's two moral questions that we're asking here. One. Is it okay for the God of the Bible to order Israel to go and do this? And two, is it okay for the God of the Bible to order it at all, to yeah. execute judgment at all? And we're saying, regardless of if he uses Israel or Babylon or the, the Assyrians or whoever, God uses nations to judge other nations. That's a consistent thing all throughout the Old Testament. So the, the moral question shifts from uh, from the implementers of the justice to is is the judgment right is it okay is it reasonable is it is it actually just and i think it's a fascinating question in and of itself when it comes to deconstruction or when it comes to defending the validity of christianity um people will say well that doesn't feel moral to me that god would do that it doesn't seem right and it's interesting because our view of moral or rightness um, our, our view of morality, of rightness in the West and in our culture, it's shifting now in this current age. But traditionally, historically, we've received our understanding of the value of human life and, hey, it's not really right for us to go against our neighbor, to deceive them, to lie, to steal. Our society says that's wrong. We're not like we, we don't do that. We I can't just go whatever. So where does that come from? That actually comes from Judeo christian values that's what originate that's where this morality and concept originated from um and so then we're looking at okay this bothers us these old testament stories because it almost seems to go against that um and here's another fascinating thing this this is a whole nother topic but it gets into hey is there a god how can i say this is immoral if i'm not going to believe in a god because where does my concept of morality even come from then? Like, how can you tell me this isn't right because you feel like it's not right? When maybe I could go to a headhunter tribe in some other country and they have no problem going and doing something uh, that we would deem wrong. But where, how can I say what's right and wrong if it differs from you? Unless there's a God or some higher being that sets the standard. Anyway, right. so that's a whole nother topic, but it brings us to, we believe there's a one true God. He has set morality. Therefore, we're basing our lives on that standard that he set. So it, back to the specific question, he asked his people to go and wipe out the fathers, mothers, and kids in these villages. Um, is there any amount of love or grace in that? What do you think, Santi? Numbers and like actually it's not the best. I got this last part in your last uh, question, but first of all, man is man. We're just uh, living dust with the life that God gave us, and we're not supposed to put God on the on the judgment seat and say, "Is it right?" I'm not saying us here, but I'm saying when people think, "Well, that wasn't fair from God to say," well. He is God. You're not. You're supposed to be on trial, not him. He's the judge, not you. Um, because of what he says in the Bible about his being, 
uh, righteous, everything he does and the way that he does it, that's the measure and the standard for justice. He is measuring the standard for justice, not us. So whatever he does is right and he's fair. Whether we understand it that way or not, it's because of our overview uh, of things, our worldview, the way we understand reality and, and interpret it. But he is who he is and he's always fair and 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 right in everything he, he does and the way he does it. Now, when talking about the uh, killing uh, and the slaughter of entire nations, we we need to understand certain uh, liberties that uh, Bible rioters took. And when they said, and they killed them all, well, if they had killed them all, then how come we find those nations still present, still present years later down the road? So it has to be interpreted sometimes as, as hyperbole. Uh, they took out all the um, warfare power or something, because also we find people being enslaved from those nations, um, or or just a mere act of disobedience, like when Joshua uh, did it, made a a treat with some uh, people group just to to respect their lives. So we need to be under uh, be aware that the Lord commanded to just wipe them all, and it was an act of his of his righteousness. Therefore, it was just and it was fair because he's the standard of justice. Yeah. But also, you mentioned something that was really um, caught my attention. You said, is there an expression of mercy, too, in those commands of, of just go do this, kill them all? Yes. And, and the reason is when when the babies and the little children before the age of responsibility would grow up, they would certainly turn to the to the idols of those nations therefore they would need to be uh, uh damned and sent to hell by allowing them to die before the age of responsibility god was actually preserving them and and taking them home to heaven let let the children come to me Th that is the only way that we can explain on Revelation 7, that there's going to be around the throne of God, people from every tribe, uh, nation, and tongue. Because, take for instance, the Aztecs here in Mexico that did not hear the gospel. Well, unless um, we would enter into a some kind of, of uh, way they, they, they uh, understood salvation through Jesus, uh they they all went to hell except whom except the babies before the age of responsibility those little elastics turn into full-grown people will be in heaven they they will be there and uh just to clarify when i say uh some kind of special relationship and understanding of god and his and his love in jesus christ to uh, take for instance Mel melchizedek who is said to be priest of God uh, in um, Genesis chapter 14, uh, but but we have no other record of him. So he had a, a relationship with God with no other uh, clues we, we can understand about that and how he came uh, to know God. But that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Those, those babies should be there. So there was an expression of justice and wrath, perfect wrath. It's not a it's not a burst of anger. God's holy wrath is holy and it's an expression of his perfection and also an expression of mercy, just caring for those little ones that died uh, in the conquest of Canaan, for instance. So there's a, a few things, Santi, I want to highlight um, and emphasize as you're sharing. So first of all, what we're saying is God is God. So whatever he does, is righteous it's moral it's right um he is god and we are not so he can freely act and decide and it's always within his character um 
so that kind of answers that question but then that gets wait, into wait before we move on from that yeah i'm not going to move on from it i'm just saying hey so that gets into then the question becomes okay if that's true why do some of these actions feel like they could be inconsistent with his character or are they really um but but yeah nate on on the character of god what he does is moral what he decrees is right um you had a thought on that yeah so it's important for us to ask this question because you're you're going to hear christians if if you're if you're looking to use this with a friend who's deconstructing or you're looking to use this in yourself if you're deconstructing based on this question and you're thinking how like the, the the next logical question is if god if the god of the bible can choose to do whatever he wants why is it wrong for the god of the quran to order muslims to attack infidels right versus the god of the bible uh to tell the jews there, to attack canaan is there a difference there and and that's a really important question to ask and i'm so glad you're asking it because it means that you're processing this at a deep level what what we need what what we need to di differentiate here is a couple of things and charlie i'll let you i'll let you differentiate them okay so as we have uh looked into islam or engaged muslims of course we've studied christianity and other religions as well um there are some key crucial differences uh in islam and in the life of muhammad and what's in the quran violence is an action used to expand and propagate and spread the muslim faith so they are bringing everything quote unquote into the house of submission of islam and they are commanded to overtake the world in any land that is not muslim in its laws uh in its buildings in its society how they function as a society anything that's not muslim they are to overtake infiltrate and make it muslim that is their goal is that propagation and overtaking of culture and society and those who are uh believing in uh physical jihad or violence in this sort of way they are viewing it as god commanding them to spread islam um and giving people that forced choice <laughs> not really a choice but basically accept islam or die or we're spread it we're going to do it by violence that's different than what's happening here in the old testament god is not asking israel to go take out their swords and go to the the canaanites and say hey convert he's saying i waited for 400 years for you to repent in my to respond to my love for you and you haven't and therefore judgment has come it's a sign of judgment against what they have done not an act of let me spread and convert and um another a uh, crucial fact of this is that the Canaanites would have been sacrificing babies to Molech, their god. Thousands and Nathan, you you know this. Uh, I mean, what yeah, thousands the, of babies? The archaeology indicates that sometimes there may have been thousands at a single time. Like mm. we're talking incredible evil. So basically, let's round up all our babies in the city. Let's get a thousand of them, and we're going to throw them in the fire that's what the canaanites were doing um so one uh this is very very different in nature islam and the old testament judaism christianity what's happening here very different in nature second it gets to the nature of god in islam uh allah or what the, that name for god is higher apart from humanity distant from humanity and his omnipotence overrules everything there isn't necessarily any sort of standard. There is no predictability of what he will do or not do. It's just whatever he wants to do. And even if you do the five pillars of Islam and fulfill what you're supposed to do, you still don't even know if he'll accept you into heaven. It's what he feels like and wants to do and decides that you are coming into heaven. I, I'm choosing you or not. Um, in Christianity, it's very clear. Anyone who puts their faith in Christ, anyone who follows God's plan for salvation will be saved. Um, everything that the god of the bible does is out of the character of his holiness and his love god is love his nature is love he's he's slow to anger and abounding in love he declares about his own nature so everything he does every action he executes is based out of that so based on that i actually really believe that when he says go wipe out 
these villages. I mean, God commanded them, kill everyone. We we can't argue that away. That's a command from God to the Israelites. Um, I believe it was not only, as we've said, an act of judgment, but I also believe it was an act of grace and mercy for the entire world. Um, if somebody broke into your house and raped and killed your family, would you not want justice for that person? You probably would, and justice for your family. Now imagine an entire society that's slaughtering thousands of babies by throwing them in the fire as an act of worship to this other God. So God waits 400 years in his mercy before he acts against them and finally says, you're done. We're putting an end to this. Israel, go in and wipe them out. I don't want this any longer to continue. And God knew if they kept their kids and other whatever, they would be raised up and likely come against Israel and continue this pattern. So I actually believe God is saying, hey, this is not my intention for humanity. This is not my intention for the world. Put an end to it. It needs to stop now. And going back to, Santi, what you said earlier uh, about um, babies and these Canaanite babies who would likely be in heaven is a fascinating conversation. Um, uh, it gets to the question of how can you say that if we are born sinful? Like how how can a baby be in heaven if they're born in sin? And it actually points back to Romans 1 where God says, uh, the scripture says this, for the, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. And then it says this, so that people are without excuse. But it's those who have seen and those who have understood. If you haven't seen, if you haven't understood, then it may be that you have an excuse. And God pours out his grace and his mercy and says, I'm going to save this infant because they have not clearly seen and they have not clearly understood. Um, John 9, Jesus points to this as well. Fascinating verse. He says, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But you say, we see. And so your guilt remains because you've seen. Um, and then, of course, there's the quote from David where he says about the baby that died. Hey, I he won't return to me like he's left. He, he's died but I will return to him one day. Um, and I, I, I just want to highlight here. Um, the logical question that emerges out of this is like, why don't Christians just go kill all the babies everywhere all the time to guarantee a hundred percent that they're going to heaven versus like giving them the option to sin in this world or they're born sinners. So giving them the option to wake up and be held accountable to what they're seeing. Like, why wouldn't we do that? And the answer is very simple. God hates murder. <laughs> like uh, his, his hatred of murder far surpasses his desire that all would be saved. Um, like he he condemns murder wholeheartedly with without everything. And his desire that all would be saved is a desire, but it's not a guarantee. So um, that that's the easy way to understand that. I'm just going to try to uh, narrow down that topic. We can go back. To, to the salvation of babies whenever you guys want but because <laughs> because it's going to take us elsewhere but um there's only one mediator between god and men there's only one name in which in whom we can be saved and that's jesus christ jesus christ paid for the sins of those that were born in sin yet not aware of being sinners so there's no way around it there's only one way to be saved and that's that is jesus christ um it would it would take us to to how we're saved from the old testament to the new testament and that is all of us have been saved through jesus all the uh, the, the saints of the old testament had one savior that's jesus let me just simplify this quickly and then i'll go back to something really important to our topic today those in the old testament that knew god and experienced his grace they lived grace like when you pay for something with your credit card you take a new tv home and you just put it on on on, uh, on your living room and start enjoying your show you have not paid for it but you're enjoying already 
those in the New Testament, we live by prepaid grace. So like when I was young, a long time before you guys were born probably, but we had prepaid um, cell phone cards and we paid for those, put the number in, and now I have some time to make phone calls and stuff like that. So those of us after uh, the cross of Christ, we live and experience God gra God's grace because it was paid in advance for us. So everybody from both sides of the cross, Old and New Testament, everybody has to look to Jesus. All those babies saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Now, I think we're boiling down some things really in a fascinating way here. And, and it brings me so much joy to say it is the typical and classical uh, mistake in Bible interpretation. It's the context. Why God commanded a certain nation to go and kill other nations because of the purpose of God of setting up a nation through which he would display his grace and mercy for everybody. The Abrahamic covenant included land to the land that I will show you, says Genesis 12, 1. You will go there, you'll establish uh, your uh, my nation there. And so it's it's important to understand you, one of you said, uh, said this and asked uh, asked a question. Uh, why don't we just go conquer? Why don't we just go kill? Because that is not the purpose of God now. The purpose of God is not establishing a nation among other nations, conquering certain uh, uh, portions of land, but it's a spiritual mission. And therefore, the commandments are different. We're not a nation that is supposed to take on swords or tanks or I don't know what kinds of weapons are out there today, but we're not supposed to do that. It's a the context of those commandments is very specific. Yeah. And in the conquest of Canaan, it was very specific. They did not take on everybody, but the specific lands they were supposed to live in. And Again, biblical interpretation, which is something I love doing. And the key to understand why God uh, brought his wrath on Israel and on other nations is the book of Deuteronomy. That's the fullest explanation we have of the Ten Commandments. And so whenever you're reading the Bible in those historical books of the Old Testament and you see some judgment for sin, you take that sin, look for it on the list of Deuteronomy, and you're like, oh, here we go. This is why he's punishing them. Right. This is why. So if we were to summarize our argument for God executing judgment, I would say our summary is God is just, and he decides what's okay. Even beyond that, he made it clear like these are sins, these are not sins. So he's justified in executing judgment against sin. And the people and God does this consistently across the entire entire Old Testament and into across the entire Old Testament in executing judgment through Israel to other nations and from other nations to Israel. In the same breath that God uh, tells Israel to go possess Canaan, uh, like just a few books later, he's telling Babylon to come and possess Judah. So like it, it's, it's he, he's very consistent. He does it the same. And uh, he's justified in doing it because he's judging sin. Um, and ultimately, there's other little bits and pieces like God's bringing about his grace uh, because he's condemning the evil that they were doing and putting an end to it. Um, there's, and so there's, there's a lot of little bits and pieces that contribute to the legitimacy of that. But the overarching concept here is that God is just. And when he executes judgment, he's doing the right thing. And he's so just and holy that he had to send his only begotten son to hanging on, hanging on the cross and lay on him the this, this sin of us all. Yes. And if we have if we have a problem with God judging nations, we should have a problem with God judging my sins on the the innocent one. Hmm. That's what 
gets us rattled up for preaching the gospel look at god's mercy because mm -hmm. he could have treated you like that but he did not he offered and he still offers salvation through jesus christ should you believe in him as your lord and savior and surrender your life to him he will cleanse your sins and, and this, this is not Santi saying this. This is the authority of the Bible that promises that. He will cleanse your sins if you believe in him and trust uh, in him for salvation. And his salvation is so powerful. It's just, it's just as if the blood was still fresh on the cross. Mm. He's still able to forgive every sin. Mm. So when we uh, wrap our heads around this uh, this topic of today's podcast about well what about god doing this and doing that well look at what he did to his own son for you and for me amen well charlie any other final thoughts before we conclude the conversation i think ending on jesus and what he did for us freely is the perfect way to end uh all paths should lead back to him and i would say um as I as we've evaluated the fullness of who God is in his character, God is love and he is holy. Um, and we see both happening from beginning to end, even in these difficult passages where we go, how could God say that? How could God command that? If you dig in and you look at his character and what's really happening, it reveals the fullness of his love and the fullness of his holiness and uh that's the picture that we see on the cross absolutely santi thank you so much for joining this week's podcast we really appreciate you man uh you have brought a wealth of knowledge which is always a blessing to us um thank if you, you guys have any questions or comments about this podcast please feel free to reach out to us at podcast at forgeforward.org we look forward to hearing from you uh don't forget to unsubscribe then resubscribe like and share we really appreciate it especially if you find this content useful hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day God bless.